All right, so today we'll be talking about solving convex optimization problems. Um, the last two lectures, basically, we talked about kind of what optimi optimization is as a very broad, uh, very challenging field. And then we talked specifically uh, last lecture about um, convexity of, of sets and functions and how that uh, when you're dealing basically with minimizing a convex function over a convex set, that's called a convex optimization problem. And, and that's a nice class of problems for which you're basically uh, guaranteed globally optimal solutions in uh, a polynomial time. So basically you can get efficient algorithms that uh, converge to a good solution in a reasonable amount of time. Um, and there are other classes of problems for which that's true, um, but you know convexity is sort of one uh, nice class of problems and it happens to be well suited to the DER stuff that we are studying in this class. Um, so today we're gonna talk basically about just, uh, it's really the, the third and, and the last kind of eat your vegetables uh, class or sorry, uh, yeah, class in the optimization section. And we're just gonna be talking basically about how pragmatically we solve these problems. And then next week we'll have one or two lectures that'll be sort of DER applications that put some of these ideas that we learned over the last couple of weeks to work in some interesting problems. So do we have any questions before we get going? All right, so we'll start out by talking about um, CVX, which is a, a, a language for doing what's called disciplined convex uh, programming in, uh, in MATLAB. And then we'll go through a couple of examples, um, basically of CVX syntax and some common uh, ways that we can program things wrongly uh, in CVX. And, uh, and solutions for those issues. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit basically at the end about uh, optimization algorithms. So what is CVX and, and the solvers that it uh, interacts with? What are those pieces of software doing kind of under the hood? Um, we won't really learn enough to code our own solvers, um, but hopefully enough to help you understand what solvers are, are doing a bit. Okay, so what is discipline convex programming? Um, basically it's a, it's a framework, a modeling framework um, for describing convex optimization problems uh, in a way that is sort of parsable, understandable by a, a computer. Um, so the basic idea is to use a library of kind of atomic functions. And we gave a bunch of examples of these in the last lecture, uh, things like linear or affine functions, uh, quadratic functions, other polynomial type functions, max, min, things like that. Um, and so it has a, an, basically a library of these atomic functions, and each of those functions has kind of a tag associated with it for both its curvature, like convex, concave, or affine, uh, and for uh, its monotonicity properties. So is it non-decreasing, non-increasing, and so forth. And then we learned um, that the basic composition rule for compositions of, of functions, uh, both a uh, composition rule we learned for curvature, and we learned another one for uh, these monotonicity properties. And so basically it uses these rules and this kind of library of functions uh, to basically certify that interesting complicated combinations of, of these basic functions lead to uh, basically convex optimization problems. So that process is, um, it's sufficient for certifying convexity. What that means is if you, you know, program uh, your problem in CVX and then it ends up getting solved, you can uh, rest assured that your problem was convex. Um, but there are convex problems that uh, you can't certify the convexity of in, in CVX. Or maybe you can, but you have to do some modeling gymnastics to sort of reformulate uh, or reframe your problem. Okay, so the, the structure of what's called a disciplined convex program uh, in, in CVX, uh, basically the objective function always has to be scalar valued. So just one number, not a, not a vector. <clears throat> and it either, either ends up being minimize a convex function or maximize a, a concave function. And then you can also omit the objective function if you want to, if you just want to solve basically a feasibility problem. So you may have a bunch of inequalities and equations and you want to come up with just any solution, but you don't really care very much about which solution. Uh, so we talked, I guess, a couple of lectures ago about how that's called a feasibility problem and, uh, and you can solve it in an optimization framework. And then we also have uh, a list of constraints and this list can be very long and very complicated, but they all have to have the same basic form. Uh, either a convex function is less than or equal to a concave function or basically you know, the opposite of that. So if you put negative signs up here, you basically get that a convex function is greater than or equal to, uh, sorry, a concave function greater than or equal to a convex function. And then you can also have equality constraints in addition to these inequality constraints. And all the equality constraints have to have the basic form uh, that one affine function, 
So basically uh, AX plus B kind of function uh, is equal to another affine function. Uh, and you can also have unconstrained problems where you don't have any, any constraints. And uh, so these inequality things here can also have affine functions on one or both sides uh, of the inequality, uh, basically because uh, an affine function is both convex and concave. So you think of a, a convex thing as being sort of bowl-shaped, a concave thing as being sort of hill-shaped, and kind of the limiting case of either of those is just like a, a straight line. Thing. So for example, you could have a convex function less than or equal to an affine function that would be OK. OK, um, so that is what discipline convex programming is kind of generally. And CVX is not the only software package that does this. Um, it's the one that does this in, in MATLAB, although actually there are other uh, MATLAB uh, packages that do similar things, um, a package called YALMIP that does, uh, does related stuff. Um, but also you can find discipline convex programming languages or, or, or tools for, uh, for Python, for uh, Julia, for R, um, and probably for other languages as well. Okay, but CVX is one version of this in, in MATLAB. Um, and it basically what it does is it takes uh, a sort of clean user specified formulation of a, a, a convex optimization problem. And it does this process of, of transcription, basically. It, it changes that into a standard form uh, that's accepted by um, a, a solver of convex optimization problems. And it takes that standard form, uh, sort of reformulation or transformation of your problem, passes it to a solver, and you can choose you know, out of a list of half a dozen solvers which one you want. And then uh, it you know, lets the solver run. Hopefully, uh, it returns you know, with a solution to your problem, but it might give an error. It might say uh, your problem was infeasible, for example. And so uh, it gets the solver status. Um, and we talked about what it means to have an infeasible problem or an unbounded problem. Does anyone remember what an unbounded problem, what that is? X squared in the domain plus positive X and minus X minus. Yeah, so like for example, maximize X squared uh, over the set X non-negative. Yeah, then you just keep making X bigger and bigger, the objective gets higher and higher, and you can kind of run away to infinity and you get sort of arbitrarily good solutions. Yeah, so that's a, gr a great example. Um, and there are many other kind of more complicate, complicated examples, but the basic idea is that there's some direction where if you move in it forever, you basically just get better and better uh, solutions for that. Good, okay, um, so then CVX interprets basically the status that the solver returns. And then if your problem is solved, it kind of converts uh, the solution back to the original form that you specified. And it basically populates uh, all the variables that you were trying to find with the optimal uh, values. So here's what the syntax for CVX looks like in a, a very simple problem. So the scope of CVX is wrapped between these two tags, uh, CVX begin and CVX end. We declare the variable uh, in the first line. Actually, the order of these statements doesn't really matter, um, but typically just for readability, you start with the variable and then you go to the objective function and then you go to the constraints. So here the variable uh, X is an n-dimensional uh, column vector, an n by one vector. And the objective function, we wanna minimize the norm of X. And uh, in MATLAB, the second argument of the norm function. So if you call it without the second argument, you just say norm of X, uh, by default, that's the Euclidean or the, the L2 norm. Um, but here I'm declaring uh, infinity as basically the, that second argument, which is the Chebyshev or the, or the uh, uh, supremum norm. Okay, so here we want to minimize basically the norm. So this is saying in, in some metric of distance, we want sort of the smallest uh, vector x. And then we have some equations here that says ax equal to b. So we're trying to find basically the smallest solution to a set of linear equations. So, um, so in this syntax here, the, the matrix A, which in general will be n by n, m by n, uh, and the vector B, these are, are data to the problem. And those are defined numerically somewhere upstream uh, of the, the CVX scope. And then X, this thing here is a variable, so it has no value before the scope. Um, but after running, assuming that your problem has a solution, um, CVX basically populates uh, X, the decision variable here, with a, an optimal solution. And then it also gives you this thing, CVX status, which is basically the exit status of the solver. So that'll be, um, uh, usually it's either solved, infeasible, or unbounded. 
but there are a couple of others. Sometimes it'll say solve, but inaccurate. Like, ooh, I don't trust the solution too much because the solver did something weird. So anyway, there, there are a couple of other options, I think, but those are the typical ones. Okay, um, so in the syntax, the indentation doesn't really matter and you don't have to write subject to. So um, so the, this you know tab here, you can do away with if you want to, and this line you can just delete. So you could just have AX uh, equal B, you know, written right here if you wanted to. Um, but for style, I think, and just for readability of the code, I think it's nice to, to write it in, in this kind of format. And one of the beautiful things about CVX is that this looks just like basically the math equations that we write down uh, on paper or, or in a slide when we're talking about optimization problems. So for the user, it's really easy to go from whatever, you know, your, your pencil and paper formulation of the problem is that you want to solve to go from that to CVX. And then CVX does all the heavy lifting of converting that to this kind of very specific form uh, that solvers like to have. Okay, um, one very common mistake is uh, that equality constraints use a double equal sign uh, and not a single equal sign, which in MATLAB is assignment. So if you try to write AX equal to B, you'll probably get an error uh, if you, in, in the CVX formulation here. And then inequality constraints like uh, X non-negative or you know, X less than equal to C, something like that, uh, are interpreted element-wise. So this basically says every element of X has to be greater than or equal to zero. Uh, another nice thing about CVX, so uh, compared to some other um, tools that you may have encountered for optimization, is that you don't have to supply an initial guess, um, which can be, you know, for local optimization methods, they can be very sensitive to the initial guess that you give them. So part of the, the challenge of this local optimization framework, which we're not really doing here, but in other settings you might, uh, is coming up with a, a reasonable, like pretty good initial guess. So you don't have to do that in CVX. And then um, also oftentimes, like if you use kind of generic uh, local optimization tools, they'll require some derivatives, either uh, the gradient or maybe even a, a Hessian, a second derivative expression um, for your objective function and maybe for constraint functions too. So that can be you know, uh, difficult to specify. You might have to do a bunch of math to come up with those things. And then you have to program them correctly and it's lots of uh, opportunities to make mistakes. So CVX doesn't require that either, which is also nice. Okay, so sometimes um, you'll accidentally, you know, through a typo or just through maybe modeling uh, mistakes, you may specify a problem that has no solution. Um, so in that case, uh, CVX will re uh, return uh, this thing CVX status with uh, infeasible. So populate with the string infeasible. And then it'll just put not a number uh, in every element of the variable X. So um, if you're using CVX in some kind of, you know, like production level code, um, you're going to put it on a robot or something like that. Uh, you may, at the end of a CVX statement, you might want to put some, some kind of checks, right, to check what the status was. If it was infeasible, maybe you fall back on some simpler decision uh, rule. Um, or maybe if it was unbounded, you, you do something else, you reformulate the problem and resolve it, maybe. OK, uh, unbounded problems. Um, so again, the basic idea here is that sometimes your problem is maybe not very well specified. Uh, so you can run off in, in some direction, and your objective just keeps getting better and better and the solutions stay feasible, and, and so there's really no uh, clear solution to the problem. So in that case, um, CVX status will uh, end up being unbounded, uh, this string, and CVX will return a numerical value for x. So you have to be a little bit careful in this setting, because it's tempting, if you don't check the status, it's tempting to think, oh, cool, I got a solution, right? And just move on, start making graphs and drawing conclusions and stuff. Um, but the x that you get may not even be feasible for your problem, usually it's not. Um, it's actually, it's a, a direction. It basically says, you know, if you move along the line, which is, you know, one unit in the X direction and two units in the Y direction or something like that, if you move along that line forever, your solutions keep getting better and better and you stay feasible. So, um, so what that means basically is if you had some feasible X, call it X tilde, uh, and some scalar alpha could be as big or small as you want it to be. If you look at the point X tilde plus alpha X for any value of that alpha, you remain feasible. And as alpha gets bigger, you uh, get better and better in the objective. So if you want a numerical value of, of some solution, um, you can just omit the objective and resolve the problem with all the same constraints 
And by doing that, uh, you get basically a feasibility problem and it'll give you some solution. Um, it won't be an optimal solution, but it'll be a feasible solution. Mm -hmm. Just a quick note, what does like a feasibility problem yeah, we talked about this a little, a couple of lectures ago. Sorry, the, so the question is, what is a feasibility problem? What does that mean? So that's a problem basically where you have only constraints um, and you, you don't really have an objective. So you're just looking for something that like, yeah, it satisfies some inequalities and maybe some equations. So in a, in a battery problem, for example, you might say, look, I have a bunch of equality constraints from the battery dynamics, the energy dynamics, and I might have some constraints related to you know, the energy capacities, the power capacities. So you program all those in, but you say, look, I just want some way of operate, operating my battery. I don't care if it's, you know, the most efficient way or the way that minimizes carbon emissions. I just want like something that keeps the battery above 40% or something. Clearly, what is a feasible solution? Exactly. Yeah. So it's, so you're just asking the computer, give me, give me anything. I don't care which one, just give me something that satisfies these equations and, and inequalities. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, yeah, cool. So like here, if we just deleted the objective here and we said there's a variable and I want it to solve this equation. Um, so this might be like an underdetermined equation where you have, you know, M is small and N is really big. So it's a, A is a, a wide matrix. And in that case, there might be infinitely many solutions. And you're like, eh, I don't care which one it is. Just give me one that works. Okay. Um, so we talked last time basically a bunch about a bunch of um, kind of atomic, you know, basic functions that that can be used to build up these kind of more sophisticated convex functions, and uh, and there's a bunch of those that that Matt, uh, CVX has in MATLAB. Some of them are pre-existing MATLAB functions that CVX recognizes, and some of them are custom functions that basically CVX built uh, on its own. The people who program CVX added to MATLAB essentially. Uh, so the max and the min function, we know that these have mathematical meanings that are pretty clear. And they have these kind of curvature and, and monotonicity attributes, right? So the max function is convex and non-decreasing. The min function is concave and non-decreasing. Um, pause, this stands for the positive part. And it's basically just the bigger of zero or uh, x. So if x is negative, it just says turn it into zero. If x is positive, we just use x. So that's convex and non-decreasing. Non um, square pause. So this is taking the, the 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 square of the positive part of of x. So you know uh, the positive part would look flat, and then it would go up kind of linearly. Uh, the square of the positive part would look flat for negative values of x, and then it would go up like a quadratic. Uh, the inverse of the positive part. This is one over x. So we know that that um, has you know it's con convex and and non increasing. Um, but if you just try to tell CVX, you know, minimize one over X and you don't use this inverse of the positive part thing, it'll say, well, look, I can't do that because the domain of the one over X function is everything that's not zero. Um, so it's, you know, convex basically for positive X, but it's concave for negative X and it has a discontinuity at zero. So it's not something you, know, you can easily uh, certify convexity with or, or minimize. So, so um, it's important to use these kind of built-in functions when dealing with things like that. Um, square root of x just has the usual meaning, but it's restricted. CVX knows that the domain of it is restricted to non-negative arguments. Uh, the norm, with, this is called the P or the LP norm. Um, again, we talked about the one norm, the, the two norm, and the, the Chebyshev or the infinity norm. Um, but you could also do values of 3 or 7 or 29.3 or something like that if you wanted to. And then the sum of squares, this um, sometimes comes up when you're dealing with like a a reference tracking problem. You know, somebody tells you to, to uh, make the power from a collection of DERs follow some profile. Uh, and so you might penalize squared deviations from that desired uh, profile. And this is convex, but it doesn't have any curvature properties. So it's uh, not non-decreasing, it's not non-increasing, it's kind of nothing. Okay, and why do we care about the curvature, by the way? So those things basically enter into the composition rules. So if you want to take, you know, the sum of the squares uh, and you want to put in here in the argument x, uh, I don't know, some affine function or some concave function or something like that, CVX will know if that's a valid operation or, or not, basically. Yes? We may be talking about this later, um, but in the so you were saying the square, for this case, um, would be used, like, oh, you're trying to find the error above 
Why do these conjecture functions tend to be the square and not just the absolute error? Yeah, so, okay, let me see if I can paraphrase the question and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so I talked about this problem where you're worried about basically the deviation of your decision variable or some function of your decision variable. Like in a DER problem, it might be the total power of a house, for example. You're worried about the deviation of that from some desired value, right? So the question I guess is in that setting, why do we typically use squared yeah. deviation rather than using say the absolute deviation. Um, I think I have an example on this either in this lecture or the next one, but I've talked about this a, a few times, right? Like the, the notion that we use for measuring the distance between things uh, is actually a little bit subtle and it influences the kind of behavior that you see from optimization. Um, historically, the reason that people used a quadratic functions for that is that um, you know, if you go back to the 1950s or 60s or 70s when computers weren't uh, that that common and they weren't that po uh, powerful. Uh, you wanted to be able to solve things basically by hand and quadratic functions you can take analytical derivatives of. So you can kind of optimize directly uh, by doing a least squares type solution. Um, so in the control world, like the linear quadratic regulator or the Kalman filter use that notion where you can kind of take the derivatives analytically rather than using algorithms. Um, so historically, I think that's where that kind of convention of using the the quadratic functions came from. Um, you, you also can use like an absolute deviation. That's perfectly fine. CVX doesn't mind. I think it's actually a little bit easier to compute typically in CVX because that you can convert to a linear programming formulation, which usually solves faster than a quadratic program. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah good, good question. Thank you. Yes? So that's a subtle, that's a super subtle question. Um, so to paraphrase for folks who are online, um, so in this inverse positive thing, I talked about how you can't use just one of our acts because if the domain is all real numbers, that's like a weird invalid function basically for optimization. But um, why can't we say use one over X and then add a constraint to your CVX formulation that says X has to be positive? Um, and, and the answer for that is basically like CVX is fussy. Uh, th this process of certifying convexity is challenging. Um, there weren't really tools to do this beyond maybe like a decade ago. Uh, so writing a code that could do that kind of checking, you know, basically, you know, Certifying, oh, you had some constraint on non-negativity, so I'm only going to look at that, you know, basically subset uh, of of possible values of x. Is in theory you could do it, but it's just not part of the toolbox, basically. So it wants you to spe uh, specifically say, look, when you look at this function, the domain is only positive numbers, <laughs> right? So that it can detect. It's like easy for it to deal with, I guess. But so this it's a broader uh, a specific case of a broader theme, I guess, which is that. Um, Again, so CVX is, is uh, it's sufficient, but not necessary for certifying convexity, right? So you could have a problem like that where your objective is one over X and you have a constraint X positive. And that is a convex optimization problem, but if you try to program it in CVX, it'll give you an error, right? Um, not because it's non-convex, but just because CVX doesn't really know how to handle it. And then you do a little bit of gymnastics, you reformulate a little bit, and then you get a nice clean form that can be dealt with. Does that make sense? Okay, we're good. Okay, um, so there are many, many other uh, examples of these kind of atomic functions. Actually, not many, many, about like, I don't know, 10 to 20 others. So it's not a huge list, um, but you know, exponentials and logarithms and things like that enter into it. And then you get into some weird ones, like, I don't know, there's something called the perspective function, which is like the ratio of two linear functions, something like that. But um, they're a little bit uh, esoteric and not ones that come up really very often in DER type optimization. Um, but there is an online reference uh, for CVX uh, so the, the site cvxr.com uh, is basically the people who wrote that toolbox maintain a, a bunch of documentation for how to use it, um, how to download it, how to debug it, um, you know, stuff like that. So if you're interested, you can always pull that up and, and read through uh, the user guide and, and get more examples and so forth. Okay, um, something that does come up pretty regularly is, uh, again, these quadratic functions that we talked about earlier. So um, oftentimes, if you're trying to make something close to something else, uh, 
um, for whatever reason, you're trying to come up with an estimate or a, a statistical model, a machine learning model of something, um, or you're trying to control something and keep it close to some desired state. Um, oftentimes we come up with basically quadratic functions that are used to, to penalize deviations between you know, your, your variable and, and some uh, desired state. So a quadratic form is basically the, um, the n-dimensional. So uh, when, when the, the variable is n-dimensional, it's kind of the analog of just a, you know, a number times x squared in the, the scalar case. Um, so a quadratic form basically has the, the form x transpose times a matrix P, which is square, uh, times x. And it turns out that you can always assume that the weighting matrix, the P in the middle there is symmetric. Um, because if it's not, then you can just replace it by basically the average of P and P transpose, which is symmetric. Um, and also the quadratic form with this thing as the weight ends up being equal to the quadratic form uh, just with uh, P as the weight. So to show that quickly, um, so if we take this weighting matrix, uh, the average of P and P transpose, we stick that into a quadratic form and then uh, expand a little bit. So we distribute the X transpose and the X on the left and the right hand sides. Um, we get an X transpose PX and then an X transpose P transpose X. Well, this thing here is a scalar, right? So um, a quadratic form is always a number. It's always a scalar. And you can see that by basically looking at the dimensions of, of the things. So here X is uh, n dimension and n by one vector. So X transpose is one by n. So one by n times n by n gives you a one by n matrix. Uh, sorry, one by n vector. And then a one by n vector, this thing x transpose p transpose by an n by one gives you a one by one, so a scalar. Okay, um, so then uh, this thing we can write as the transpose of x transpose p transpose x because the transpose of a scalar is always the same thing, right? So if you just have the number nine and you take its transpose, it's just the number nine, it doesn't change. Um, so you can replace this thing, the scalar, by its transpose. And then we can take the transpose here and distribute it. So if you have uh, three matrices multiplied together, A, B, C, and you take the transpose of the product, you basically flip the order. So it goes C, B, A, and then you transpose everything. So it becomes C transpose, B transpose, A transpose. Um, so that's all I'm doing here. And then we basically have two of the same thing. Uh, we're adding them up and then dividing by two. So it ends up just being X transpose P, X. Okay, um, so in CVX, I think uh, this thing, X transpose PX, if you try to just write it in, you know, you have a variable X, a matrix P, and, and uh, you try to write it out, uh, CVX will probably give you an error. It'll say, I don't know what to do with that. But if you tell CVX, look, I'm dealing with a quadratic form, uh, the variable is X and the weight is P, um, then it's fine. It, it knows what to do. Okay, so when is a quadratic form uh, convex or concave? So basically to answer that question, we uh, need to define something called um, a positive uh, definite or positive semi-definite matrix. So in the, in the scalar world, when is A X squared convex? Well, it's convex when A is non-negative. Um, okay, so we need a, a basically a notion of non-negativity for matrices rather than for scalars uh, in order to generalize that sort of one-dimensional quadratic form into, into n dimensions. And so that notion of non-negativity for matrices, um, at least one of them, is called positive semi-definite. And we denote it with basically an inequality sign, but we use kind of a weird squiggly inequality to just emphasize that we're not dealing with numbers, we're dealing with, with matrices. Okay, so if this thing X transpose PX is non-negative, then we say that P is a uh, positive semi-definite, if that holds for all values of X. And uh, it turns out, I won't show this, but um, if you do some linear algebra, you can uh, show that that's equivalent uh, to the determinant of P being non-negative. And that also is equivalent to every eigenvalue of P being non-negative. So you can check uh, if a matrix is positive semi-definite by looking at its eigenvalues and just making sure they're all positive or, or zero. Okay, and then uh, a positive definite matrix, this just generalizes the idea of strict positivity, uh, a strict inequality to, to a matrix. So this says if you take any non-zero X, and you look at the quadratic form X transpose PX, that that thing has to be positive. And uh, basically we get the same conditions here on the determinant and the eigenvalues, but just with strict inequalities rather than non-strict 
Okay. Um, so why, are, why am I talking about this? Well, basically, uh, because a quadratic form is convex if the weighting matrix is positive semi-definite. Uh, and it's what's called strictly convex, which just means more or less that there's a unique global minimum. Um, it's strictly convex if, if P is basically strictly positive or positive definite. Okay, so that's uh, convexity. You can also get concavity, right? So if, if P is what's called negative semi-definite, that just means that negative P is positive semi-definite. So if uh, if P is, um, or rather if negative P is, is positive semi-definite, then the quadratic form negative X transpose PX is uh, convex. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, this is, I probably should have written, written that out a little bit. Um, it gets confusing, but uh, the, the positive semi-definite, basically this is the condition that we usually want to check. Okay, so, um, Something to note if you're dealing with quadratic forms in CVX is that they tend to be a little bit slower and less accurate than just using norms. Uh, and you can reformulate most quadratic form type problems at, in, into norm type problems. So um, as an example, suppose that we want to minimize the sum of squares between AX and B. So this is basically solve a least squares problem. Um, so that is just equal to, if you factor it out, to the two norm of AX minus B. So that, uh, sorry, the genome squared of AX minus B. So that can usually be done faster, and this might be a little bit counterintuitive, but by uh, minimizing the norm of AX minus B, the two norm of it, which is just the square root of the uh, two norm squared. So this seems weird because we're adding in this kind of square root operation rather than a squared operation up here, um, but actually it ends up having kind of better numerical uh, properties. And uh, how do we know that minimizing the sum of squares is the same as minimizing the two norm? Um, well, if we have any uh, increasing function, we talked about this two lectures ago, but um, that's ancient history by this point, so I'll just repeat it. So if we have some increasing function, uh, if you wrap an objective function f of x in that increasing function, uh, that's equivalent to just minimizing the, uh, the objective function f of x directly. So here our f is like the, the squared two norm, and our g is the square root. And uh, g is, uh, sorry, the square root function is, is non-decreasing um, for positive arguments. And the norm is, is always non-negative. Um, so then we get this uh, sort of composition rule working. OK. Um, so that's if you have uh, quadratic forms in the objectives. You can also do a similar thing if you have quadratic forms in the constraint. So suppose you want to keep something like the, the tracking error um, you know, between some desired state and, and your actual state. You want to keep that error uh, small below some level C. Okay, so um, to do that, uh, it helps to note that a positive semi-definite matrix uh, has a, a unique square root. Um, so if P is N by N, it has what's called the square root R, which is also N by N. And if you take that thing, transpose it, and multiply it by itself, you get back the original matrix so this is, again, a generalization of the square root from numbers to matrices. And so one way to calculate a matrix square root um, is to use what's called the Cholesky factorization, uh, C-H-O-L or Chol in MATLAB. Uh, and it, it comes up with an R that satisfies this equation. It, it also happens to be upper triangular, meaning uh, if you look at anything below the diagonal, it's all equal to 0 in the matrix. And that's just nice computationally for, for various reasons. OK, um, so since the two norm of y is the square root of y transpose times y, um, we get basically this nice uh, chain of equivalences here. So we can look at our constraint that we want to satisfy. It has the quadratic form on the left-hand side and just a number c on the right-hand side. Well, because p is equal to r transpose r, where r is its matrix square root, uh, we can write uh, basically replace the quadratic form with, with this term here. And that we can recognize as just the two norm squared of uh, r times x. And then uh, we can take the square root of both sides, uh, as long as c is non-negative. Um, and we get basically the two norm of this thing rx less than or equal to the square root of c. So we can always replace basically our original constraint, the quadratic form less than c, uh, replace that with the two norm with the matrix square root in here, which is pretty quick to compute in MATLAB, uh, less than the square root of c. So either of these will, will typically work in MATLAB uh, and, and CDX. So um, 
if you're just trying to do you know something kind of quick and dirty and get a basic solution and check its properties, it's probably fine either way. But if you're trying to write code that you're going to run a bunch of times or, or something like that, then uh, you care about the speed of the code, and, and it's probably better uh, to go through and reformulate using norms rather than uh, quadratic forms. Make sense? Yes? I'm curious, what's like, when you say it's faster and slower, are we talking like, oh, I have to wait a couple of seconds for this to run, or can it just wait two months? Yeah, so when I say faster or slower, are we talking about like a factor of two speed up or like a factor of a million, something like that? So um, I have an example here that, that shows that. Um, thanks. So um, yeah, in this example, I just want to do uh, the, the least squares problem. So we have an unconstrained problem, and we just want to minimize the, the two norm squared uh, between some B thing and, and some AX thing. So we talked about how this could be used for curve fitting uh, in a, a machine learning kind of context. Okay, and we know this thing has an analytical solution, which is kind of nice for a, a sample problem because we can look at uh, if we use different CVX formulations, how uh, the formula, the solution compares to the, the actual um, sort of analytical solution. So I just uh, kind of ginned up a random problem instance. I use pretty big um, matrices. So 500 variables and a thousand uh, basically rows in this matrix A. And uh, I, I drew independently uh, the elements of A and B from Gaussian distributions or standard normal distributions. So basically zero mean variance one uh, with a bell curve kind of on the random variable. So the analytical solution, um, this is, uh, we talked about this some time ago, but it comes from what's called the, the, the pseudo inverse or the Moore Penrose pseudo inverse. Uh, and you can compute that in MATLAB by just doing a backslash B. So this backslash operator in MATLAB is, is very powerful uh, for solving linear equations. So this takes about a 10th of a second on, on my laptop here, which has a 2.7 gigahertz uh, processor. Okay, so let's see if we use the sum of squares solution um, how long it takes and how accurate we are. So if I take that same problem instance and I minimize the sum of squares of this AX minus B thing here, uh, then I end up solving uh, in about two and a half seconds. Uh, so I don't know whatever that, that is, a factor of 200 uh, greater. And then um, basically it agrees with the analy analytical solution to nine decimal places. And you could get more than that if you wanted to because CVX has some settings that you can get certain level of precision uh, numerical precision. So you could increase those error tolerances or decrease them, and you might get 10 or 12 digits of accuracy. But you, you know, eight is usually good enough for engineering work. So. Okay, so then what's the speed up is, is the question. If we go to the, the norm formulation rather than the, the square uh, formulation, what do we get? Uh, it turns out it's about 42% uh, savings. So it's like a factor of two speed up. So it's not huge. It's not going to save you a week of compute time. Well, maybe it will. I mean, if you have a gigantic problem and, and it's you know taking two weeks to solve, then maybe it saves you a week of time. Okay, and it has basically the same accuracy. So here I'm using the norm in the objective function rather than the previous one I was using the, the sum of squares. So we get the same solution, uh, basically up to nine, nine decimal places, and it takes around half the time. Yes? Getting a little into the weeds of like computation time mm -hmm. like theory, but with that, like this is a very simple kind of example. Does that like 42% less computation time scale with the number of computations you do? So the, the question for folks online is, um, here's one random problem example, right? But what if we changed the dimensions? Would, would we always have kind of roughly a factor of two speed up or would it be more or would it be less in, in different settings? Um, it's a good question and I don't know. Um, we could, you know, basically run experiments on, on the computer to, to test that, right? So I could basically sweep from n is you know, 10 up to n is 1,000, something like that, and run and, and store the, the time savings, basically, and then plot that. And uh, my guess is that there's probably, I don't know, I, I, I actually don't have a good guess. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's probably some paper written on it. I mean, so broadly speaking, the, the compute that CVX does can be thrown into two buckets, right? So one of it is the kind of transcription that CVX does, where it takes your problem formulation, which might be weird, <laughs> or it might be straightforward, I don't know, but it takes yours, and then it, it basically reformulates it into an equivalent problem that's in the standard form for the solver. And so there's that's kind of step one. You, you can call that modeling or transcription. And then step two is actually solving the problem. So now the solver has it and it runs as efficiently as it can and then gives back a solution. And then I guess there's the inverse transcription and modeling part where you reformulate it in the user specification. So um, so the breakdown between those two things is, is not clear. Um, 
And you know, sometimes like half of the time of actually getting a solution back is just waiting for CVX to do that modeling step. And so again, we're as you said, we're getting a little bit into the weeds, but there are things that you can do as the, the modeler, the user, to basically make that transcription step that CVX does to make that quicker. Um, so one example is using norms rather than, than squares, um, but there are other things that you can do. If you can vectorize rather than using loops, stuff like that, then usually it, it's a lot faster. Yeah, yeah sure. OK, um, so I just want to show maybe the most common error that you get when using CVX. <laughs> so OK, here I'm basically just taking this thing, and I'm writing it in a slightly different way. So this sum of squares thing, it just takes every element of AX, subtracts off the corresponding element of B, and then squares that. And then it just adds them all up. So that is exactly mathematically equivalent to taking the norm, the two norm of this thing, which does that same, that same process, but then takes the square root, right? So it's taking the norm and then, and then squaring it again. So that undoes the square root. So mathematically, these should give you the exact same thing. But what do you think happens if you program this in, in CVX? Yeah, the rest of it says, get out of here. I only deal with convex problems, and, and I can't guarantee that your problem is convex. Um, and so this is what that error looks like. It's called a disciplined convex programming error. And it's by far the most common error that you will get when using CVX. And here it's telling me what is illegal about this. So it says we have a convex thing, uh, basically a function that's tagged in, in its library as being convex. And then we're raising it to the power of two. And it says, this is not a valid operation, basically. Uh, the result of this is not necessarily convex. And then it gives you some advice. Consider using these other atomic functions here. So pow pause, uh, it knows, is the power of something, but it's restricted to only um, positive or non-negative uh, input arguments. OK, so um, the reason that, that happens is here we have norm, which is tagged as convex. Inside, we have an affine function. And CVX knows that a convex function of an affine function is convex. Okay, so far, so good. But then we take a convex function, and we do a convex function of it. So the square function is convex. Um, but convex of convex is not necessarily convex. <laughs> okay, And so that's what fails. So convexity is not necessarily preserved under, under composition with con convex functions. Um, but we do have a rule. Actually, let me hide that for a second. So, so we do have a rule that has to do with a convex function of another convex function. And there's something in there about monotonicity. So does anyone remember what that needed piece is to make this work? Nope. Oh, okay, that's all right. Um, so basically, in addition to having convexity, we also need the function to be increasing or, or non-decreasing. So, um, so if we use the function square pause, which is one of those atomic CVX functions that it's just you know x squared, but it knows that the domain of that function is restricted to positive x, then we know that it's it's bowl shaped, right? It's it's convex, but also for positive arguments, it's non-decreasing. And so, a convex non-decreasing function of a convex function is convex. So, if you use this form, square pause raised to the power of two. Um, sorry, square pause, which is basically this, but just recognizing that the norm is always non-negative, um, then you're fine, right? So then you'd get a solution. So, yes? So is there not a group? Are there cases where convex of a convex is not convex? Uh, why, why yes. So there are cases when a convex function of a convex function is not convex. And I think of one off the top of my head. <laughs> I mean, the classic example is like x squared, and that if you square it is, is x fourth, which is fine. Um, anyway, I'll get back to you next lecture with a couple of examples, maybe some pictures. Um, but no, yeah, there are counterexamples to, to this rule. And that's why CVX freaks out. Basically. I'm going to be thinking about that in the back of my head for the next 20 minutes or whatever. That's fine. Um, OK, so the last thing that I want to talk about really for this kind of crash course on optimization is how solvers work, right? So when I call this thing on a, a, you know, a problem with 500 variables or whatever, how does it figure out exactly what the numerical settings of all those variables should be? Um, so that is, again, like each, each one of the kind of subcomponents that we've talked about in this like three lecture crash course could itself be like a whole class. 
And here at Purdue, you can take a whole class on optimization algorithms, um, you know, probably multiple classes actually. Okay. Anyway, we're not gonna get into you know, all the details, but hopefully just enough to kind of give you a flavor for a couple of the most common algorithms and how they work and maybe a little bit about how they can go wrong, I guess. Okay, um, so why are we learning about this? Well, it turns out that to use CVX, you don't need to know anything about this. So there's kind of a, that's part of the, the design philosophy of that software tool and, and of discipline convex programming in general is that there should be a firewall between basically users of optimization and designers of optimization algorithms. Um, so there are people who of course do both, but you shouldn't have to know about the guts of an algorithm in order to basically get good solutions to optimization problems. So, um, yeah, so, so we could just stop here and, and be done with optimization basically and start going into DER. Um, but I just wanna give you a little bit of an intuition for, for where these things come from. Um, it can help, basically, I think it's cool and partly, I just like it, um, but also I think it can help sometimes with debugging, with interpreting results. Um, you know, you might wanna switch solvers at, at a certain point if uh, one solver is better at a certain class of problems, something like that. Um, yeah, these algorithms, they can be super clever. They can be kind of beautiful. Um, they also sometimes highlight ideas that can be used. Uh, in other uh, problem settings, you know, maybe you aren't dealing with DERs or optimization, you, you know, you're working on some robot problem or something like that, and you might say, oh, you know, here's something that I could do. I could kind of take a derivative and go in a, a descent direction, something like that. So, um, anyway, yeah, and, and so we'll just scratch the surface here, and of course you can go much deeper if you want to. So we'll start, um, we'll talk about basically a couple of problem classes, and we'll start with what I guess is the easiest one, which is called smooth, unconstrained, convex optimization. So here we want to decide some variable x. It's generally n-dimensional. And uh, we want to minimize some convex function. And uh, the objective function he f here is, uh, is smooth. And that basically means it's um, you can take derivatives of it. Whatever derivatives you might want, you can take. And uh, usually it ends up just being a first or a second derivative. OK, so for this problem, uh, there's an optimality condition, which Basically, we're dealing with like a bowl-shaped kind of function uh, in general. And uh, we can take the, the gradient of that thing uh, at any point kind of in the design space and then um, set the gradient equal to 0. And, uh, and we know that basically an optimal solution will solve that uh, equation. So the gradient of a, a, a scalar function of n variables is an n-dimensional vector. So this thing on the left-hand side has a dimension n by 1. And the thing on the right-hand side here would just be basically n zeros. So this is n equations with n unknowns. And if f uh, happens to be quadratic, so um, that means it's a, a quadratic form, possibly plus a linear function, and then possibly plus a constant. Uh, so in that setting, then we can exactly write down the gradient of the, of the function. And again, Levi, to your question, this is partly why uh, quadratic functions are used so commonly, because we can do analysis and, and write down uh, derivatives. So if uh, f is, is quadratic, we can write down its derivative, and it ends up just being 2 times the quadratic form uh, weighting matrix p times x uh, plus q. So the linear part, basically, the, the variable goes away. And you can think of this, you know, you can do a proof to, to show that this is the case. And I think I actually showed this a few lectures ago. Um, but you can also just imagine the scalar case, right? So if you just had a number p times x squared plus some other number q times x and plus a constant r, if you just took the derivative of that, you would get 2px plus q, right? So that's basically what's happening here, just kind of in vector and matrix form. Anyway, so if we're in the quadratic setting, then we get basically a system of linear equations, and we can solve that system directly. Uh, and uh, if p is invertible, then it has an exact sort of unique solution. Uh, which is negative p inverse q divided by 2. So we just move q over, divide by 2, and then multiply on the left uh, by p inverse, and we get x star is equal to this. OK, but in general, if the objective function is not quadratic, then um, you know, its derivative is going to be more complicated than, than just a linear function. And, uh, and so solving the equation gradient f equal to 0 will be uh, more complicated in general. And so for this, we typically use what are called iterative solution methods. So here we just jumped to the exact solution, but usually we do basically a, a sequential process of getting closer and closer. So in these iterative methods, uh, usually we begin with an uh, initial guess, x0, uh, which should be in the domain of the function that we're dealing with here. And then these iterative methods will produce a sequence of what you call iterates, 
uh, typically, you know, go from X1 and 2 on uh, potentially forever, but usually we stop in finite time. And those iterates should all remain in the domain of the objective function, uh, basically, so we can evaluate f of x uh, whenever we want. And we say that the iterates converge um, if uh, basically the function value f of xk, if that converges uh, to the optimal value f of x star, where x star is a solution to the problem. Um, and uh, also we want the gradient to converge to zero um, as uh, we get further and further along in the, the process. Question? Is that an initial guess what they refer to as warm starting? So, yeah, yeah, it is. So, so the question is, um, is this initial guess here what we refer to as, as warm starting? Um, it, it can be. So warm starting is basically spec uh, initializing uh, an algorithm like this with a, a pretty good guess. Yeah. Right. So oftentimes you don't, you know, know before you solve your problem what the solution should look like. So you don't really know what a, a good guess should be. Yeah. Um, but you can imagine if you did have some intuition, you know, oh, this one should be positive and and this component should be, you know, smaller than that component or something. You could kind of come up with a, a pretty good guess and then warm start the algorithm. Yeah. And you can imagine your convergence time would be shorter if you start from a better initial position. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because these algorithms, they may start far away from an optimum and then they kind of hone in on them over time. Yeah. And so you're basically starting closer to the optimum so you should get there faster. That's the the hope anyway. <laughs> so, and I'll show a picture of, of what that looks like. Okay, um, so a descent method and not all iterative methods are descent methods, but a lot of them are. Um, they basically uh, have this general form. So we start with our initial guess, which is in the domain of our objective function. And then we just keep repeating something, uh, these four steps. So we find what's called a descent direction. Um, so you say, okay, if you're on, I'm at this current point, in what direction is the function decreasing? Um, and then we find a step size. So we wanna move in that direction, but how far should you move? So that's this thing alpha. And then we do a simple update, which is uh, basically you say the new iterate is equal to the old iterate um, plus alpha times D. So plus my step size times the direction. And we just repeat that, we increment k, and we just kind of keep going until we get to some stopping condition. And oftentimes, the stopping condition is we look at the gradient of the function. Um, and if it's small, then we know that we're close to you know, basically the gradient being 0, which is our solution uh, condition. So um, the descent direction and the step size, in order for this to, to work and, and to be a descent method, um, that basically means we get better and better, closer and closer to the minimum as we go. Uh, they should satisfy, first of all, um, the new thing, x plus, uh, k plus 1, which is x plus alpha d, that thing should be in the domain of the function. So if you're dealing with the, the logarithm, for example, then the new iterate should be positive. Um, and we should get that f of, of the new iterate, x k plus 1, that that thing should be less than the current uh, value. So the objective should get better and better as we go. So. Um, the second problem, basically, of finding a good step size, a good value of alpha for which these uh, two conditions are met, that is called a line search. And it's a, a general problem that occurs in a lot of optimization algorithms. And the typical way that we solve it is using a method called backtracking, uh, which was invented in the 40s or 50s, something like that. Uh, and you can read a Wikipedia article on this uh, and, and uh, find more about that if you want. OK, so then the gradient descent method, which is maybe the most famous optimization method that there is, this is how, with minor modifications, basically most machine learning models are trained today. So gigantic neural networks with billions of parameters are typically solved using what's called stochastic gradient descent. Um, anyway, so uh, basically the, the underlying idea is that the negative gradient of the function points in the direction of steepest descent. So we learned in vector calculus that the gradient points in the direction of steepest ascent. So if you have a hill-shaped function, it basically always points toward the top of the, the mountain. So the negative gradient then points down, uh, downwards. So um, the basic idea of gradient descent is we just take our descent direction d and we use negative gradient there. And, uh, and we just run this method, right? So we uh, step one is just you take the negative gradient of f, and then we run out this method with a backtracking line search to find alpha, and, and uh, off you go. And uh, you can prove that for convex functions, this typically requires on the order of one over epsilon iterations, so steps in your algorithm, uh, in order to get uh, the objective value of your iterate uh, k to within epsilon of the, the best possible value of f of x. Star. So if we wanted, um, say, four decimal places of accuracy, we would need 1 over 10 to the 4 
uh, sorry, yeah, uh, one over 10 to the minus four, which is 10 to the four iterations. So we need about 10,000 iterations to get four decimal points of, of accuracy, decimal places. So it's slow, in other words, the gradient descent is slow. <laughs> and here's what that might look like. So this is a, a, an illustration from a, a great book on convex optimization, which I should have mentioned earlier. Um, but so if you want more information about the stuff that we've talked about over the last three lectures, you should definitely read this book. Uh, it, it's beautifully written and, and a great resource. Um, but this is what it looks like. So imagine that we have, we have kind of like a, a bowl shaped function here, uh, but it's steeper in some directions. Basically steepness means that these contours are closer together. So this is like a very, uh, very steep uh, portion of the function. And then this is a flatter portion of the function. Uh, but basically it's decreasing as you get closer to the center here. So the gradient uh, is always, you may remember from vector calculus, it's always orthogonal or perpendicular uh, to the contour lines of the function. So we see a right angle here. So we start at this x naught, we say, okay, where's the gradient? Well, it's orthogonal here. So we move in that direction. And uh, so that lands us over here. Okay, now the gradient points this way. So we kind of go this way. Now we zigzag down again. And after a bunch of iterations, you end up kind of in the bottom of this bowl. So you can think of this as like, um, if you're doing the opposite of mountain climbing, you're doing like valley descending, <laughs> I guess, but you're doing it in the dark. And all you can do is kind of like tap your foot around to see in what direction the hill is like going downward. So you, you kind of, you got blinders on and you're like, well, I'm gonna move down this way. Um, and then I guess every time you take a step, you're like, you decide a number of steps you should take. You're like, well, that's going down in this direction and I'm gonna take some number of steps, like a hundred steps. And you walk a hundred steps in that direction and then you do it again. You kind of feel around again and say, which way am I descending? You turn and you walk, you know, a hundred steps in that direction. <laughs> so it's kind, of a, it's kind of a dumb way to get to the bottom of a, a canyon or whatever, but you can do it, I guess. Uh, and that's more or less what this algorithm is, is ending. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So the the backtracking line search, what it basically does is it, it tests out, you know, can I take a hundred steps in this direction? Oh, if I do that, then I'm gonna like get to a point where I start going back up again. So that's too far. And then it says, oh, maybe cut that in half. What if I what about 50 steps? Test that, and then you kind of keep keep doing that backtracking process until you find a number of steps that's like pretty good. Okay. Uh, what I'm thinking is, so like you have a boundary with like six different um, local minimums, and you go like let's say hundred steps out, and then you see that you're going up. But if you were to go 105, you start going down again, but you the so that's a tuning parameter that you would choose by your not your step size, but the amount of increments you're getting. Uh, like how do you choose how many steps ahead you look? Yeah, so so that basically okay. <laughs> to paraphrase the question for folks who are online. Um so suppose that we weren't doing a convex problem, we were doing a non-convex problem, which had multiple local minima, yeah. right? And you kind of start out in one valley, um, but if you go too far in a descent direction, you might end up walking back up the other side of the valley and into another valley, right? Which could be a better or a worse valley, you don't really know, right? So you could get up in the situation where you're close to a good local minimum, but you take too big of a step and you end up like in the basin of attraction of a bad local minimum. Right. So how do you, what do you do in that case? And the answer is like, I don't, you don't know. I don't know. There, there, there are various ways to do that. So in the stochastic gradient descent, you would use kind of randomized versions of gradients and you take small steps and stuff like that. And uh, in machine learning, the, the choice of the step size is called the, the learning rate. And it's a very sensitive thing and, and different uh, packages basically have different ways of coming up with the learning rate and they determine how good your algorithm is and how long it takes to train and stuff like that. But the answer is that this is a hard problem. Um, so for convex problems, it's sort of easy because um, you know you're guaranteed you're always basically in one valley. Um, but for non-convex problems, it's much more challenging. Yeah, I'm just thinking about like a mixed integer problem, which you could see like a local one. But the time at which you choose to exit that problem, like is that the is that the parameter that says okay, like if we're 
that this makes an ender problem and we have a solving time exit at three minutes, whatever the minimum is after three minutes. We're going to just go with that solution. So, okay, the question is about what's called mixed integer uh, programming, Sorry. where, no, 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 it's, it's fine. Um, so, so basically, you can think of a convex problem, but just uh, pick some of your decision variables and say, rather than being real number, continuous numbers, they have to be binary, either zero or one. So you have a mix of kind of continuous things and, and discrete things. So that's called mixed integer programming. And one way that, that algorithms will solve that is, um, they're called branch and bound techniques. Basically, you, you test out different combinations of your binary variables. Set this one to zero and that one to one, and then you solve basically uh, a continuous optimization problem, often a convex problem, for the other values, uh, the, the continuous valued variables. And then you do that for a while, but that thing, the runtime of those algorithms are, are exponential uh, in the number of variables in the problem. So they can take a super long time in, in a, for a bad problem instance to solve. And so um, oftentimes when you call a solver for a problem like that, you'll give it a budget of time. You say, look, um, don't, don't run forever, right? I only have three minutes to make a decision and then I need to get on with my life, right? And so you give it that. And typically it'll run uh, and it'll be doing maybe a descent method, maybe some other method. You know, the solutions aren't necessarily getting better over time. Maybe they are, hopefully they are. But anyway, it would keep track of kind of the best, the running best solution so far. And then whenever you tell it to exit, it'll just give you sort of the best thing that it's seen so far. That makes sense. It's, it's, that's not about step size, really. It has kind of a different algorithmic flavor, but that's more or less what, what that is doing. Good, good question. Thank you. So Levi is using optimization in his research right now. So <laughs> lots of uh, relevant questions. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I know, I know. At some point, we're just going to be in a group meeting. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to alienate everybody who's not in my research group. <laughs> OK. Um, I think we can finish up here probably. So, um, okay, so so that is the gradient descent method. And there are better, faster methods if you have more information about your function. So gradient descent only requires uh, basically first order information, the ability to take a first derivative. Um, but what if you had second order information, you can take a second derivative. You would think that you could do better than you could in this kind of um, more restricted setting. So the idea there is um, to come up with essentially a quadratic approximation to your function. And then we already have a formula that I showed you guys. If you have a quadratic form, you can basically jump directly to the local, to the minimum uh, of that thing. So you come up with a quadratic approximation to your function, you minimize the quadratic approx approximation, and then you repeat. So um, how do we come up with a quadratic approximation? Um, so this is basically Taylor's theorem. Usually when we use Taylor's theorem, we only use it to first order. We linearize the function, but you can quadraticize the function too if you want, or cubicize, I guess. You can keep going to whatever power you think is, is interesting um, and useful for you. So this is the formula from, from Taylor uh, of what the uh, second order approximation, the quadratic approximation to a function looks like. So the kind of constant part is just the function value that you're at. Then there's a linear part, and, and this is what you would see if doing kind of normal linearization. And then there's a quadratic part as, part as well, which has a, a quadratic form in it. And here, this thing, del squared, uh, it looks like a gradient, but then it has a, a squared on there. So that is what's called the Hessian matrix uh, of a, a scalar valued function of n variables. That's an n by n matrix. And it ends up being uh, positive, either definite or semi-definite, uh, depending on the function. And uh, you can do some algebra, and I won't go through all the steps, but basically, uh, if the Hessian is invertible, then the thing that minimizes the quadratic approximation is this thing x hat, which is equal to the current thing x tilde uh, minus the Hessian inverse times the gradient. So if you have second order information, you can compute all these partial derivatives that are the elements of the Hessian, and you can compute all the first derivatives that are the elements of the gradient, and you can you know, solve this basic linear equation and, and get a, a, cent, a descent direction out of, uh, out of this equation. So here's what that looks like. The, the real thing we're trying to minimize is this thing uh, blue, uh, which is f of x. And then the quadratic approximation at x tilde, it matches the function value. That's the zero order uh, approximation. It matches the slope. That's the first order uh, approximation. And it matches the curvature um, at the point x tilde. And so we minimize the quadratic approximation that gets us to x hat. And you can see that that gets us kind of in the right direction. It gets us close to the true minimum of uh, the thing that we're trying to minimize. F. So this gets us to what's called Newton's method, uh, another very famous method in, in optimization. And the idea here is you just use the descent direction that comes out of um, that quadratic approximation. 
And this method, so again, it's just a descent method. So we already said in general how these descent methods work. Um, so you just use those four steps iteratively again with some stopping condition. But now your descent direction, rather than being the gradient, uh, is this thing, the Hessian inverse times the gradient, the negative of that. So this converges uh, much faster, uh, even in the worst case scenario. So again, now here, if we want to, uh, basically it's one over a square root of epsilon rather than one over epsilon. So if we want to get, uh, for example, 10 to the minus four, so you know, four, say three or four uh, decimal places of accuracy, that'll take about 100 iterations rather than about 10,000 for gradient descent. So this is 100x speed up. And what does that look like on the same problem? We start with the same initial guess. Before we moved in, in this direction, the gradient direction, and now we're moving much closer to basically the, the direction of the true uh, minimum. So here we move here, we, we again take the Hessian and the, and the gradient, multiply them, you know, take the inverse and so forth. And then we get to the global minimum, usually in much fewer uh, steps. Okay, does that make sense? All right, so that's unconstrained minimization. Newton's method is kind of the, the go-to method uh, for that. Um, and there's a kind of a variant of Newton's method, which is pretty similar called the Gauss-Newton method, which actually only uses first order information that approximates the Hessian. And often it, it works about as well as Newton's method, but it's easier to run um, because you don't have to take all the second derivatives and form the Hessian matrix. Okay, um, so for smooth constrained optimization, again, we wanna choose this n-dimensional uh, vector. We wanna minimize the scalar valued convex function. And then we have a bunch of convex constraints. And this looks almost like the kind of general form of a convex optimization problem that I showed you guys like three lectures ago. But here we have the additional assumption that all of the functions, the constraint and the objective functions are all smooth. So we can take derivatives if we want to. Okay, um, so the idea basically behind uh, these constrained optimization methods is to reduce them or approximate them by uh, unconstrained optimization problems. Solve a sequence of those, and we already know how to do that using Newton's method and then um, you know, basically cleverly deal with the, the constraints. So um, the underlying idea for that kind of clever dealing with the constraints is to recognize that you can write a constrained problem as an unconstrained problem with a potentially infinite value, uh, infinite, infinite valued terms in the objective function. So this thing i uh, with a, a minus sign, i of the uh, negative part and the negative uh, orthant, uh, basically this is the indicator function of the set of z in the real numbers such that z is non-negative. And it's zero anytime z is non-negative, so it adds nothing to the objective. It doesn't change the problem, basically, if you're feasible. But if you're infeasible, meaning z is positive, then this thing returns infinity. And so the objective value is infinity. Basically, you're doing infinitely badly, right? Um, so you wanna obviously, when you're optimizing, stay away from those bad things that get you to infinite, uh, infinitely bad objectives. Okay, so this is just a modeling, modeling gymnastics that you can always do uh, in optimization problems. And then uh, the idea of the logarithmic barrier function is to come up with a smooth approximation to this indicator function here. And to do that, we use the log of the negative here. So log is, uh, you know, goes to, to minus infinity, basically, um, when we get close to zero. So the log of the negative thing basically grows to plus infinity as we get close to zero. And then um, we can scale this thing by basically one over t, which determines more or less how steep this function is. So this thing is called the logarithmic barrier function uh, minus log of negative z divided by t. And it's an approximation of this thing here, the, uh, the indicator function. And the approximation gets better and better basically as we crank up the knob uh, on this t parameter. So here is what that looks like. Um, so we have some variable z, scalar valued thing uh, on the x-axis. Uh, and the dashed red line here would be the indicator function. So it's zero on the, you know, basically for negative z, and then it goes up arbitrarily large, right? It goes up to plus infinity at z is zero. So the log barrier here um, with t equal to one, I don't know, not too steep, but it's kind of roughly doing um, what the, uh, the indicator function is doing. And then as we get higher and higher values of t, we get closer and closer in that approximation. So even for t about 10, we get actually a pretty good approximation of this function. So now the idea then is basically just, instead of minimizing f plus the indicator uh, of all these constraints, we minimize f plus the log barrier of all those constraints. So here's how these barrier methods work. We start with an initial guess, t naught. We have a parameter, gamma. And then we have some initial guess, uh, which is in the domain of our objective function. 
And then we set xk plus one, the, the next iterate, by minimizing, basically by solving an unconstrained minimization problem. And we can do that with Newton's method or whatever. And then uh, basically we just upgrade t as gamma uh, times the old value of t. So uh, bigger values of gamma are going to give you bigger increases, basically, in this tuning parameter t. And then you do that uh, until some stopping condition is met. And that stopping condition could be you have a very big t or something like that. So again, in this first step, essentially, we use Newton's method. And we do uh, what's called warm starting. So we already have a pretty good guess at what the solution will be. And that's the current iterate. And so we warm start Newton's method for this problem using the current iterate. And then the solution becomes the, the next, the updated iterate. And so there's a trade-off in kind of the design of these algorithms. Basically, if you are more aggressive with the parameter gamma, uh, then you don't have to do as many of the sort of outer iterations, but you end up doing more of the Newton iterations kind of uh, on the inside of this step one. But you can show that these barrier methods converge uh, at a rate that's similar to Newton's method. So kind of a, a one over square root of epsilon sort of rate. Um, okay, and then so we generalize gradient to uh, so descent methods, gradient descent, Newton's method, barrier methods to deal with constraints, and then that gets us all the way to what are called interior point methods. Um, so these are the methods that are used by most of the solvers that CVX uh, plugs into. Um, conceptually, they're very similar to barrier methods. Um, they have some minor differences, but but quite similar. Um, they don't need initial guesses. They don't need uh, Hessians or, or gradients or anything like that. Um, which is weird, right? Because we talked about Newton's method being kind of an, uh, uh, a subroutine, essentially. Um, but anyway, the interior point methods essentially eliminate the need for that. Um, they have polynomial time guarantees and a worst case complexity. Um, so this means more or less that you're guaranteed, even for a bad problem instance, that you get a, a good solution in a reasonable amount of time. Um, they often are very fast in practice. Um, so the, the guarantees that we have here, the kind of one of our root epsilon convergence rate is a worst case guarantee, but oftentimes you get lucky with a good problem instance, and then you solve much faster than that. Um, and the speed of solving with these interior point methods typically scales with uh, the difficulty or the generality of the, the problem class that you're working with. So linear programs, which it's nice, uh, end up being mostly what we will solve in this class with, uh, with DER problems. They're the easiest and the fastest and the most robust to solve. Um, quadratic programs are a little harder. There's something called a second order cone program, um, kind of generalizes a quadratic program that is harder yet. And then basically the most general class of problems that we have in convex optimization is called semi-definite programming. And there your decision variable is actually a matrix and you have constraints basically saying that that thing has to be positive semi-definite and so forth. Uh, and that actually generalizes all of these other uh, problem classes. So you can write a linear program, for example, uh, in a semi-definite programming form. Um, and those are the hardest to solve. And, and actually, for large problem instances, they're uh, still an active area of research, trying to find good uh, numerical methods, stable, robust, fast uh, numerical methods for those problems. OK, sorry, I know I went a little fast at the end there. Um, but again, just trying to give you sort of a flavor for um, how these optimization solvers are, are actually working when you call them. So um, time for a question or two, if anybody has one. Yes? What makes it an interior point method? Yeah, so why do they call it interior point method? Um, so basically, it's kind of by contrast to something, which you would, I guess, you could call an exterior point method. And, and the classic version of that is what's called the simplex method for linear programming. Um, so a linear program, again, is, is minimize a linear function basically over a polyhedron. Um, which we talked about those, that, that sort of shape on Tuesday, right? So, uh, but a polyhedron is defined by a bunch of linear equations and inequalities. So it turns out that the solutions to those linear programming problems um, are always on the, the boundary of the polyhedron. So you don't actually need to look in the middle if you're kind of searching for a solution. You just need to look at what are called the vertices, basically the places where you have these you know, linear uh, equalities, the, the wedges, basically, the, the corners of those wedges. Um, so the simplex method basically just moves between the, the vertices, the, the exterior points of, uh, of, of uh, the feasible region. And, uh, and that basically was the algorithm that was used for optimization. And basically the kind of optimization problems that we solved were linear programs for like from 1950 through like the eighties or something. <laughs> so it's just a famous, and it's still used. It's still very, very fast. It's used very often today. Um, so an interior method is kind of defined by contrast to that. So rather than going around the edges on the outside and kind of testing points, 
you move around on the inside. Good question. Is it yeah. just like random or is there a method to it? Yeah, there's a method to it. So it's, so it's very similar to the barrier method that, that I presented here. So it uses the logarithmic barrier function. It does something kind of like Newton's method to pick a good direction to move into. It chooses a step size, moves in a direction, right, and, and resolves and so forth. So yeah, um, that, that's why I kind of built up um, the, the barrier methods because it, it looks a lot like that conception. Okay. So for seven quadratic programs, um, okay, so first off, for linear programming, you can just move unconstrained convex optimization where you don't need an iterative method. Uh, so the question is for linear programming, can you use a smooth, unconstrained optimization algorithm? Uh, no, because linear programming in general does have constraints. Okay. But there is there's this method called the simplex method, which was designed specifically for linear programming. It has a very different flavor um, from the methods that I showed today. It has a much more kind of computer science-y, everything is discrete sort of flavor to it. Um, and you can use that one for linear programming problems, but not in general for, for these other complex problems. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we, we can chat after if you want. Um, okay, so I think we're at time. So uh, thanks. And we'll do some DER examples and, and stuff like that to hopefully make these things a little more concrete uh, next week.